Well, tonight is really sort of urgent update and for you to hear from really, you know, the Japan's leading uh, anti-nuclear campaigner about the, the latest situation and where this could go. But I guess we both share a hope, and hopefully you share it, and that's that this could, could go somewhere and that it becomes an outlet for, for action um, at the local level, at the national level, at the global level, and really begin to shape a response to this um, in, in some way. I, I have a lot of, um, you know, to me a big reference point is the BP oil spill about a year ago. You know, it was all about plugging that hole. <laughs> And, but the stuff was spilling and, and, and gushing, and it's kind of like now with them trying to get that power plug into the, you know, the pool of the, to get the rods so they don't explode, and it's like a race against the clock. This stuff could, could get a lot worse than it is right now. But for IFG, I guess we wanted to do this for a few reasons. First of all, to elevate the voices of you know, the key activists and, and analysts who, who are doing this work so that you get to hear from them and get to know them, and you'll have some big opportunities later to support their work directly because these are folks who work on a shoestring budget and, and any bit of support helps. Um, secondly, IFG wants to help put this in the context of the broader global context of energy and climate and, and resource scarcity crises, something that we called the triple crisis a few years ago of, of uh, climate change, of peak energy, and of peak minerals and water and soil and, and all other resources on the planet. So it's, it's within this context that, that I you know, see it of um, not only the BP oil spill, but today's decision to it sounds like invade Libya to enforce a, a, a no-fly zone, but it looks like uh, ultimately to possibly occupy and control the government of yet another OPEC member and secure oil supplies. Big opportunity that overshadowed the, the reporting in, in Japan today. Um, you know, the, the Massey coal mine explosion that caused workers. Um, the food riots right now that are in large part driven by the biofuels policy of, of the U.S and of the European Union to get off of the oil and to find other um, energy supplies and, and resources. So everybody faces this crisis right now, how to power a modern economy, and we know that there's simply just not enough resources in the world to do it. And the technologies all require too many inputs and have too many risks associated with them, that really the only answer is, is conservation and efficiency, and then renewables. Um, and that's where at least IHG sees this, this work has to go. So we want to help um, get people's head around this crisis and how we see it in the broader context and how we somehow move from just putting out these different fires to addressing broader systemic issues. So a lot for, you know, two hours on a Friday evening, um, but we wanted to at least help uh, create a space for, for that conversation. Um, so that's pretty much what you're going to be hearing about tonight. You'll also have a chance to hear from folks who can give you uh, direction on taking local action on both the uh, Diablo Canyon and the San Onofre uh, renewal of their permits. Potentially, there was an action in Oakland earlier this evening. We'll hear about that. Um, some of you may also know that President Obama is supporting $36 billion in loan guarantees for the nuclear industry. Um, just reading the Financial Times analysis on it, yesterday, I mean, it pretty much proclaimed that this is an industry, again, at risk, and it's financing at risk if it doesn't get these, these loan guarantees, um, and it's probably this, this crisis that could really help set that back. A lot of it depends on the response that happens from the communities and grassroots groups. So that's where I think a lot of it comes back to what, what could potentially come out of this discussion. And then as an organization who works a lot on the global climate negotiations, because we know that they're welcome, come on in, plenty of seats up there, um, that the world needs to rapidly shift off of these uh, dangerous gases that come from the fossil fuels, and nuclear has been presented as, as one of the, the clean options for it. Um, this really knocks a hole in what's going to happen with global climate negotiations. Japan, some of you may remember at uh, last December in Cancun at the UN Climate Summit, Japan sort of threw a bomb by saying it would not renew its Kyoto Protocol commitment. And the fear was that then is Japan's jumping ship, which the U.S. never got on the ship, you remember, um, might trigger Russia and then other of the biggest polluting countries 
jumping the Kyoto ship into some new thing that nobody knows what it's going to be, but it appears to be weaker than what, what we had. So n those countries now not having uh, the option or at least questions being raised about nuclear, it kind of throws a lot of countries' emissions targets into, into, into doubt. Um, anyway, so a, a lot of big issues tied up into here, but the main reason is um, you all came is to hear from Eileen Miyoko Smith, who a few months ago became um, Green Action Japan, became a fiscal sponsor of, of IFG. Um, that's, uh, and we say Green Action Japan, it's really Green Action, but there is a Green Action here, so just to, to distinguish it. And like I said, she was, she was here on vacation, um, and she made it pretty clear she was here on vacation. She might come in to visit, but then when this erupted, um, exploded, in fact, everything s sort of changed. So the thing you need to know about um, Eileen is she's been doing this since the 60s, her, her activism in the 70s um, against uh, mercury in Japan and in Minimata, um, uh, fighting the, uh, the fast breeder and, and stop that from, from coming to Japan. Um, the plutonium trade, the export of the, the, the nuclear waste. Um, her organization is the one that, that sues the government and makes sure that they have evacuation plans and, and makes sure that you know, the, the zones are, are as far out as they need to be. And of course, they don't get everything. But I've come to think in, in the last few days of as this credibility gap has grown between the Japanese government and the US government or the international nuclear authorities, that Eileen's organization is the one that's going to tell you what the Japanese government isn't telling you because they know where all the bodies are buried and, and where all the um, sort of the worst parts of, of the industry are that, that the government authorities aren't, aren't going to tell you about. Um, and then from there, we're certainly going to have a discussion, which um, Claire Greensfelder, a longtime uh, local and global activist on, on nuclear issues, will, will help lead us. And um, we hope nobody leaves without making um, some sort of uh, uh, help for, for Eileen's group because they uh, survive on a shoestring budget, so you'll have an opportunity to help in that way as well. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, to Eileen. Um, welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited and grateful uh, to be here and have and everybody being here. So uh, thank you. I'm going to sit down. Um, and just for a correction, uh, we're not your fiscal sponsor. You are our fiscal sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, yesterday um, when um, NBC came and um, uh, interviewed me about uh, Japan, I suddenly became extremely nervous, and that's because, and I've been facing this problem um, all the week um, with lots and lots of radio interviews and TV, and that's because uh, the people I know in Fukushima and north of there who've been fighting so long for decades, concerned about the safety of the Fukushima nuclear power plant, addressing the earthquake issues, uh, they cannot speak right now. Um, they are evacuated. They, I don't, some of them, I don't even know where they are. Um, and uh, first message I got was from a car, cell phone, she, and one woman saying we're evacuating. And um, we, we haven't been able to be connected to her yet. Another uh, cell message, uh, just a split second, a colleague that I know that we work with together in Osaka, uh, he said, uh, Muto-san called, um, and he's alive, and that he's from Miyagi. And it was because he said, she, he's, Mr. Koyama said he just heard a split sound, but it was his voice, and it was his cell number because it was registered. So then we found out he's all right. Um, and I just felt at the beginning like, well, we we're going to hear from everybody. But then when I look at the towns and some of the places where I know they live, it's just completely wiped out with a tsunami. So that's the situation.